Welcome everyone to the 192nd meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. This is one of our special um, uh, special meetings. This is not one of our regular monthlies. Uh, as you can see, we're in this very special space uh, and a very special speaker. Um, tonight, we are going to be hearing about a talk on uh, ButterFS, is how I've always heard it said. I just want to make sure I've got that here. And we're going to be hearing um, about from its primary author, Chris Mason, who is, uh, you're going to see appear on the stage in a moment. Um, I'd like to say how much we appreciate AppNexus providing this great space uh, to us today, and thank you to all of you who have uh, shown up. Um, your uh, presence makes this possible, just as much as Chris and our work, and we really appreciate you showing up and taking time out for this. Uh, tonight, before we get started, we have a bunch of our usual requests. The first is silence your cell phones. I didn't do that yet. Please don't kill me. Um, do not eat snacks in noisy wrappers or uh, eat food that makes noise. That will uh, make it very difficult for everyone to enjoy the presentation. And we are streaming tonight, so when it comes time for questions at the end, we'd appreciate it if you come over here. There's a mic you might not be able to see from the back, but there's a microphone here, so we'll ask you to line up uh, all on this side, and we can ask questions one at a time. If you ask with the microphone, then people who are on the other side of the stream and uh, on the recording later will be able uh, to hear your question and understand the answer. Um, our next regular meeting will be with Daniel John Gilmore on new PG and the future of PGP. That will be on Friday, May 29th at Bloomberg. Um, in addition, we will be having a special talk in June on Core OS. Uh, that will be June 17th, and we will have, um, I'm sorry, that's not a special talk. Actually, a little confused. So we have a, a June talk on both Core OS and Leonard Pottery will be giving a special talk on System D on the 29th of the 30th. So please check out our meetup page for the specifics on those. Um, as we always do, I'd like to thank our regular space sponsor, Bloomberg, because they uh, support our continuing existence and our ability to do this. Um, and our other sponsors, IBM Canonical, Randor Group, Google, and O'Reilly Media for their support. Um, in addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our sponsor, uh, sorry, not just our sponsors, but also our volunteers. So I want to thank everyone who volunteers. Um, they contribute greatly and continue to contribute. Uh, tonight, for this special event, I would uh, especially like to thank AppNexus for providing us with this space. They're being very generous in their sponsorship, the food, for the beer, for the uh, other beverages. Um, so uh, please welcome Andrew from AppNexus. He's going to say a quick word. Hosting uh, New York Log. Um, we rely at AppNexus, we actually rely heavily on Linux and other open source software. We run roughly 65,000 actual servers. So we're, we're pretty big around the world, globally, five data centers. Um, we service up to 5 million requests a second externally. So that's external web requests to us. And we generate roughly 175 terabytes and process terabytes of logs a day. Uh, so Pretty extensive you know, dish, uh, scale of Linux, especially our processing stuff. So, with that, I guess if you want a job, come talk to one of us. Hiring, <laughs> you're a fan of C, you know, you guys are Linux, you write a lot of C. And if you come talk to one of us, instead of applying to the website, we will get a referral bonus. So, definitely do that. <laughs> hey. Thank you. Um, thanks. <laughs> So, um, again, talk to him, him first, I guess, or one of the other people, not Nexus, uh, if, if you want to uh, particularly to your, uh, if, if you want to get dinner with them, I guess, uh, at the end of the day, if you get hired. Um, so, uh, after the meeting, uh, we encourage everyone to join us for more talks and drinks at the storehouse across the street at 69 West 23rd Street. So just across 23rd Street from here, we will be continuing uh, conversations there. We'll have an opportunity to talk to uh, anyone who's here there. Um, so announcements. Uh, the workshops, please talk to Rob and David this month. Uh, there will be no more uh, workshops because uh, City University has uh, exams. And once those exams are done, we'll shake out what the schedule is after that. Is that correct? Right on. Right on. Um, in case you missed it, there are some Linux DVDs, distro DVDs in the back over there, and they are yours for the taking. If there's a distro you meant to experiment with but haven't had the time to download or uh, put on media, those are there for your use.
groups, please feel free to take one. Um, does anyone else have any other announcements? really quickly that Nice Camp 2015 will be um, in July of 2015. I don't have the dates off the top of my head, but check it out at www.nicecampnyccamp.org. It's going to be at the United Nations building for a whole week of Drupal coding, you know, sprints, uh, community, everything that you can imagine. Does anyone have any other announcements? All right. Um, at the end of the presentation, there will be trivia questions asked, and we have a bunch of books and vouchers to give away. So uh, please remain for that and pay attention to the presentation, and Chris will be asking you those uh, questions at the end. Um, so now, please welcome Chris Mason with his talk on ButterFS. just for the ButterFS talk. I always love the chance to speak. Uh, I live up in um, Rochester, New York. So anytime I get to talk somewhere on the East Coast, it's, it's a wonderful thing for me. Um, as I said, please, uh, please try and remember any questions you have. Uh, I try and keep the talk short. I try and focus on questions. It's really my favorite part. Um, so I'd love to hear anything you have or suggestions. Um, as I go through these, the very first thing that I always say about ButterFS, and this was really the most surprising thing to me when I started ButterFS development, is how many people came in and joined the development app. Um, so I always try and make a point of thanking everybody who helps. Uh, there's a very broad ButterFS community uh, from Facebook, of course, SUSE, Fujitsu, Red Hat, Oracle still contributes, um, the company out in Germany, Strato, Intel, Fusion IO helps a lot. I employed me for a lot, and Joseph as well. Um, but so it's really my favorite part. In the, in the last year, I tried to make a slide that had just the subject line of all the commits that we put in in the last year. And uh, it, it actually, if you look on the web page, it goes down to like here. You know, it's, it, it's too big to even show up there. Um, so there are a lot of contributors to our requests, a lot of individuals, a lot of companies. And it's really the major reason uh, that we're as successful as we are. So the main features for ButterFS, and I always put this one first because it's the part that we kind of built the file system on top of, um, efficient writable snapshots. When, when we started the file system, we really wanted to say, what can the other file systems not do? The existing Linux file systems are really pretty awesome. And there's, it, it takes a lot to justify uh, the work and getting people to switch and all the maintenance and everything. Uh, and so we were looking for the features you know, make people say, okay, I really want to try that. And so number one, the snapshots are very efficient. They cost about as much as a directory. They are writable. They are snapshotable again. Um, so it's really a core part of the file system. We do internal rate with restriping. So what this means is ButterFS can directly manage hard drives for you. Uh, without having to go through LVM or ND or any of the other software RAID layers. And it can very easily switch in between different RAID levels uh, at any time. So you can set the file system up with RAID 1, you can switch it to RAID 5, you can switch just your metadata uh, from RAID 5 to RAID 1 if you find out the RAID 5 performance isn't what you need. So it's very flexible in terms of how it manages devices. It also does all of its device management online. So if you need to add a device, or remove a device, add on space up across all the drives, it does all of that online. It's not actually possible to do it without the file system mounted. We do have online scrubbing. So what scrubbing does is when you have any kind of real RAID array from an enterprise manufacturer, they actually have little background processes that run around and make sure that the data on the drive uh, is the same as when you wrote it. And that's how they catch when individual sectors on drives go bad, kind of silently without them noticing. It's one of the secrets of the hard drives, especially, is that um, they almost never return errors on writes. They only return errors when you read it later, which is very often long after the data is gone. Uh, we support transparent compression. 
So uh, this really came about because Intel was very nice, and they sent me a 32 gig SSD that I really wanted to put into my laptop, but I didn't have enough room. <laughs> so, so I had a transparent compression of the file system. It does both Zlib and LZO. Um, we're able to sp spread the compression work out over pretty much all of your CPUs. So we'll use as much CPU as you have to get the compression done. Uh, it, it works very well. So the question was, do we do encryption? And uh, the answer is not yet. It's definitely something that we're looking at. We're looking at first before encryption. I have some slides on this. Uh, Leonard Pottering especially has some really interesting ideas about shipping around integrity verified images. Uh, and so I'm looking at integri ver integrity verification first, and adding integrity verification to the letter if I send and receive stuff. Uh, so that's higher up on my list there. Uh, but it's definitely there. Uh, because the um, background process threading pool that we have uh, works so well at spreading the work out, it's a very good <laughs> fit for the encryption uh, This next part is really important. It's one of, the, one of the other foundational parts of the file system. We do CRCs both for data and metadata. So for any piece of data on the file system, I can make sure that it really was the same as when it was written. And if you're using uh, some duplicated rate level, either rate one or rate five or rate six, if we get a CRC error, we can pull the data off the other block uh, and then fix the error. Uh, so that helps a lot. And it actually covers, catches a lot of silent data corruptions from the drives, where the drive doesn't give you an IO error, but it just returns the wrong thing. And we have had that happen in production at Facebook. So that was really interesting. My favorite example of this is we have one uh, major RAID array. You know, it's a PCI card with a big white back cache that goes into the machine. And we had a whole bunch of machines, many thousands of machines with this particular card. And it en ended up being that there was a BIOS bug, ButterFS found, where when you read a specific sector on the drive, on the RAID array, it would always return an EFI head every single time. So they sent me a corruption report because they always play ButterFS first. And they sent me a corruption report, and I looked at the, the bad block, and it was an EFI header. And then I looked at the corruption reports on 100 other machines, and they were all EFI headers. And then we figured out they were all in the same logical block. <laughs> and I, I said, it's fine, not a ButterFS block. Sorry. Uh, we also do efficient incremental backups. Uh, it's a really big deal. The structure of the file system allows us to very easily find uh, what has changed and send that out very quickly. And uh, we do our quotas but in a slightly different way than a lot of the existing Linux file systems. We do it on a set volume basis, which is kind of like saying we do it on a snapshot basis. So you can think of it as a quota on a directory instead of a quota on an individual file for a specific Um, the ButterFS CRCs, I talked about this a little bit already. Um, they cover both data and metadata. Uh, one of the great things about them is they're able to detect both lost and misplaced writes. So one of the ways hard drives will commonly fail is the head will be moving along and you tell it to write here, and the head will actually do it uh, over there somewhere. And so when ButterFS reads the block, it can figure out whether or not uh, it was really the block that you had written. So volume management in ButterFS. I took a lot of these ideas from the old digital ADDFS file system, which was one of my favorites back in my system administration days. Um, but the way we do it, because I didn't want to have to have symmetrical drives. I didn't want to have a requirement that everything be done on a full drive basis. These drives are so big right now, that's effectively an infinite amount of time it would take to do any operation. So instead, I broke all volume management tasks up into chunks. And it's a relatively small piece of the drive. It's one gig, two gig, maybe. And it makes it um, much easier to do volume management. So the chunks are broken up into either data or metadata. And then what we do is we create rate groups out of chunks. So if you have three drives, we can pull RAID 1 for, meta for metadata over two of the drives. And we can pull RAID 5 for data over three of the drives. 
because we're doing it in these small one gigabyte, or two gigabyte pieces, we construct a logical address space out of that. And then when you want to do something like remove the drive, we do it one gig at a time. And that way you end up with something that's a manageable thing that you can iterate over. If you need to unmount the file system, you can pause whatever volume operation you're doing. You can uh, mount the file system again, and then resume it. So it turns something that's really very difficult into something that's very, very easy to manage. It also basically makes a whole ButterFS file system kind of sparse. If you add a new drive, you just haven't allocated any chunks for it yet. You can add a new drive pretty much instantly, because all it's saying is, I'm increasing the amount of available space in the file system. So ButterFS is all built on B-trees. And the B-tree is really important because it's how we maintain um, our copy on write snapshots. So it's really the core fundamental part of the file system that we use for everything. And when you look at kind of the B-tree structure, one of the unique things about ButterFS is that we um, do all of our balancing operations from the top down. Now, because we're copy on write, what that means is that in order to change anything, for example, this leaf block down here. Um, I need to make a copy of that block. Now, something has to point to that block. You see this pointer to this block here. So I have to copy this block to point to the new location. And so forth and so on, all the way up the tree. So we do all of these operations from the top down. We have nodes at the top. The nodes don't have any data or metadata in them. They just point to other B-tree nodes. Or they point to leaves. And then down at the bottom, we have B-tree leaves. Okay, and so these are what store all of our important things in the file system. And whenever we want to change something, we start at the top, and for each block that we go down, we change one of these. So it'll start up here, and then go down here and down there. Now the important part is, each of these blocks has a header, and the header has the generation. The generation is what we use when we're looking at the B-tree to figure out which blocks have changed and which blocks have. So if I'm looking for a new file, and I know it was created in a specific transaction ID, I can follow that generation number from the top down, a path through the tree, and end up just finding the one block that I changed. And that's how ButterFS is able to very efficiently send snapshots over the wire, um, because we have these generation numbers for tracking different extents. So the current status of ButterFS, this is kind of a long-running joke, especially among ButterFS developers, is ButterFS ready? And there's a lot of debate, uh, you know, among us, you know, is it something that people really want to start trusting their data with? And one of the great things about coming to Facebook was that we got the chance to have a whole bunch of data that was heavily, heavily replicated. And we could hammer on ButterFS harder than really any, anybody else had before. So when people ask about the current status, now, this is always my answer, it's aging. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a fine wine, but um, it's definitely ready to be used in production. We have a lot of production systems at Facebook with ButterFS. Uh, we have 90 terabyte file systems. We have those replicated over many machines. It's getting a lot more use than it ever has before. <clears throat> so the way we do it in production at Facebook is that we have our production workloads. Those right now are all on 310 kernels. So I take everything that's in mainline and I backport it onto 310. And that's what we run on our production systems. This slide says 318, I missed that. It's actually 4.0 now. Uh, our internal next step kernel at Facebook is going to be 4.0. Um, so we're starting to roll out 4.0 kernels as well. We're going to do the same thing. We just backport all the changes. And it's pretty easy to do when you do all of them. <laughs> it's actually easy to start you know, picking and choosing. But once you take all the changes, it's pretty easy to maintain a, a backported set. The workloads we have, it's mostly Gluster. Those are our biggest installations. And Gluster is used in a whole bunch of ways. Most of the files are fairly large. We're not doing a lot of database workloads right now, which is really the, the place where ButterFS kind of falls down in performance. Because we have copy on write for everything, you do a write into the middle of a database file, uh, we end up fragmenting that file pretty badly. And 
uh, most databases do a lot of random writes into the file. Um, the big thing that I like to talk about when we are doing our production tests here is we're actually able to compare, because we have them heavily replicated, we're able to compare with the other file systems really easily. So we have one set of servers uh, that are a great comparison set where we have XFS and MotorFS with exactly the same data and we're able to see how well they're performing next to each other. And um, last month they, they told me it really wasn't very good. <laughs> um, so they sent us some bug reports and we were able to fix up uh, some latencies during commit and get us back on par with XFS. Uh, the problem was really only because the file systems were getting up into the 90 terabyte range. We had some performance problems that were basically order of the size of the file system. So uh, we fixed those up and it's uh, dramatically better now. And the other part I really like to underline is that all of these fixes are being sent upstream. So even now the last 4.1 merge window is what we're doing right now. 4.1 merge window had a whole bunch of ButterFS fixes that came out of Facebook production. Um, and so I really love that I'm able to not just improve the file system, but get the fixes out there for everybody else to test. And of course, the best part about having an upstream is people find bugs in the fixes, and it makes the Facebook production work much better. Um, volume management improvements that we've been making. Uh, Fujitsu, in the last couple of months, they completed some scrub and device replacement features for RAID 5 and 6. Uh, it also improved uh, the diagnostics for when bad blocks trigger corruptions. Uh, we're, adding, we're adding some throttling to scrub. Scrub is really nice because uh, it was very carefully written to be able to consume 100% of your drive bandwidth, which is fantastic when you're trying to figure out if things are broken, but it's really not a very nice thing to do in the background. <laughs> and uh, so we had some problems where it was taking over servers. So we're adding some throttle into that. And we're also making it uh, much more flexible for uh, RAID 0 striping, RAID 1 mirroring, and RAID 10 to be able to control the number of devices that contribute to a stripe set or a mirror set. Right now we only do two-way mirroring. Uh, we'll add three-way and four-way mirroring as well. Um, Power failure and crash testing. This is always one of the hardest things to do in a file system uh, because power failure testing requires a whole bunch of machines crashing randomly. And inside the file system itself, the window where power failures trigger corruptions are usually very, very small, especially when we're trying to be correct with power failure testing. Uh, so Joseph Bassett, who also works at Facebook, uh, he made a fantastic framework to be able to use um, device manager targets to actually pretend to make the device disappear at just the right time. And so that takes away the whole part where some guy has to walk up to a server and rip out the power cord <laughs> and replaces it with a very refined way of saying, I know this is the worst possible time to turn off the power. I'm going to pretend I did it right now. So he found some uh, difficult bugs in ButterFS. We've got those fixed up and those patches are upstream. Um, I really think it kicked off some of our last set of file systems corrupting and we don't know why some problems. So database performance. I talked about this. Um, RFS is really, truly pretty bad in database performance, especially in comparison with the other Linux file systems, which are really very good. Um, but there is one exception to this, and that's uh, file systems like RocksDB. Uh, which basically do append-only uh, database formats. RFS is really good at depending on the files. And we're able to manage those growing files very well. And so uh, we've done some early tests that show ButterFS having much less write amplification and better performance overall compared to DexFS than rocks to do. So this is something that we're looking at more carefully. Um, this is one of my favorite recent developments in ButterFS. Uh, Dave Sturba from SUSE has taken over maintenance of the ButterFS utilities. Uh, this makes me very happy because he does, he's doing a much better job at it than I did. And uh, our patch backlog is pretty much gone now. We just released a new version of the utilities uh, yesterday and we now have very steady uh, utility releases to keep up with the kernel features. So I really appreciate that. 
Um, file cloning is another new, new thing, the kernel anyway. ButterFS has been able to do file cloning. You know, file cloning is, is instead of a snapshot, which is an entire directory tree, you can clone an individual file. A lot of people like to do this, um, especially for like a VMware image file or something like that. Uh, it's actually a little bit slow, slower than a snapshot, because a snapshot is basically order one. It's very, very fast, no matter how big the file system is, a snapshot takes exactly the same amount of time. Um, but a file clone, a file clone will vary with the size of the file. So if you have a one terabyte file, it'll take a lot longer to clone than a one meg file. But it's a feature a lot of people want. So ButterFS has been able to do that for a long time. Um, Zach Brown from Red Hat uh, recently sent out a new API, or a generic API, uh, so that other file systems that are able to do this kind of cloning are actually able to provide that to users. Which is good, because the core utils has been just calling the ButterFS specific IOCTL for years, which is kind of nice. Um, so the big other people that use this are IFS. Uh, and it actually helps a lot because it saves you the pain of copying a file from an NFS server to your machine and then back to the NFS server with a new name. It's kind of ridiculous. Uh, so that's in the NFS specs now and we're going to start being able to use that. Uh, Subvolume quotas, I mentioned them before. Uh, Subvolume quotas were one of the things when we designed the file system that I expected to be really, really easy. I thought it was going to be a killer feature that was very easy to maintain because we had all these B trees and it would be easy to figure out who was using what. Um, in fact, it actually ended up being exceptionally difficult. So, <laughs> uh, we've had a lot of improvements to the core code. Um, Mark Fash is from SUSE, just passed from Facebook, spent a bunch of time in the last six months, and uh, it, it is dramatically better now. Fujitsu has also picked up where they left off and added even more patches. So, uh, quota code is really becoming something that you can use. Uh, new logging infrastructure, this is my current project. Improving our F-Sync logging performance, improving our RAID 5 and 6 parity logging so that we uh, won't have the RAID 5 right hold. Um, this is a very long-term project, but uh, I'm making a lot of progress on it now that I'm in Facebook. Uh, deduplication, this is uh, this is one of those features that very few people really, really need, but a lot of people ask for. <laughs> and uh, the idea is that if you have two files or two blocks that are identical, uh, you only have one copy of that data. And a lot of people want it. Um, mostly the people that need it have backup servers and things like that, or clones of systems. It's a, it's a relatively small number of places where the cost of actually computing all the checksums to deduplicate things is actually worth it. Uh, but so, uh, there's a developer from Oracle, uh, Lubo, whose regression is path set, uh, and we want to get this uh, into the kernel this year. Uh, there is an existing set of um, functions that you can use to do out-of-band dedu. We call it out-of-band because uh, someone other than the file system is responsible for figuring out what's identical. Um, because we have snapshots and cloning and all those other things, we already have all the infrastructure we need to uh, share blocks between files. We just need to tell someone to tell us which ones are the same. Um, improved support for non 4K systems. This is a big IBM feature. They have a lot of um, systems with 64K page sizes. And ButterFS does not accommodate this very well right now. Uh, so there are patches from IBM coming up that will make it much easier to share uh, file systems between 4K page system like an Intel box and an IBM uh, Power PC machine. And this was the one I mentioned uh, that Leonard is very interested in, uh, per subvolume integrity keys. We really want to be able to take a file system that has been stored in an untrusted location and be able to verify that the data is what we expect it to be. Uh, and so the idea is you know, just be able to ship things over the wire and get updates over the wire uh, and still do integrity verification on a per subvolume basis. So this is something that we're actively working on. Uh, I think it'll be really cool. And it's something that, as far as I know, nobody else is really doing very well on the Linux kernel right now. So, next steps for us. We're really focused on uh, stability, feature completion upstream, definitely performance as well. Uh, expanding the ButterFS production workloads inside of Facebook. We're 
moving Facebook onto uh, basically our web tier machines. <coughs> web tier machines are really interesting because they're what you uh, connect to when you go to facebook.com or you go on with your phone. Um, but they don't actually have any of the data. So uh, the important thing about the web tier machines is we're constantly updating the software on them. Facebook.com is updated twice a day, every day. And uh, we need better ways to get those updates out there. So that's one of the ways that we want to do that with our address. And I also put in here uh, some benchmarks that I just did today. So they're not exceptionally well formatted. Uh, but this is a, a run of benchmarks that we often do uh, when the file system maintainers want to uh, kind of make fun of each other a little bit. <laughs> Um, this one originally came from Dave Jenner, who works on XFS. And uh, it's a set of parameters to the FS mark utility that just creates a whole bunch of empty files. And what this graph is kind of showing you here is there are three parts to the graph. The first part is um, the device I.O. This is, if you picture what it would look like when that hard drive head is going across the drive, each stop is somewhere that the hard drive head touched. So um, you can see during this workload, which created was somewhere in the order of 24 million files, um, it took XFS about 430 seconds to do so. You can see it's kind of scattering the I.O. all over the drive. But the really interesting part with XFS especially is this line right here. So what that is is the XFS ball. It's basically a Every time they do a metadata operation, they have to log it somewhere and make sure that they're crash safe. And on workloads like this, especially with XFS, the log is what ends up being the um, bottom line in terms of I'm waiting for space in the log to keep working. And what's really interesting is you can see that they're writing during the test right around 61 meg per second. They're, they're pretty smooth, they average that consistently. And their CPU time is really pretty low. So for XFS, 430 seconds, 24 million files. Came out to right around 60,000 files per second. So I ran the same one and extended four, and you can see the I.O. is totally different. Go back to XFS, scatter out over the drive, one bright line in the middle. Go to extended four, and you can see it's going in steps. These weird little staircases over the file system. So what those are, are those the extended four I.O. tables. Standard 4 has fixed locations on the drive where it, st where it stores all of the inodes. And you can see it walking through each of those fixed locations. And then it has a big bright line where the log was. Now the interesting thing is Standard 4 wrote much faster. It was doing about, uh, we'll say, 350 or so meg per second for the bio. And their CPU times were pretty similar. XFS had a CPU time of, you know, we'll call it 25%. Uh, extended 4 was very similar. But if you look at the time to run the test, Extended 4 did it in 200 seconds instead. It was roughly twice as fast. They ran at about 150,000 files per second versus 60,000 or so for XFS. So I ran it on ButterFS and uh, we ran at about 250,000 files per second. So instead of taking 430 seconds, we did it in 62. And the major difference here is you can see our system time is around 75% system time. We were actually completely CPU bound on the run. So if the box had had faster CPUs, our numbers would have been better. The other file systems were completely I.O. bound. We didn't do a lot of device I.O. It really wasn't very exciting. We had a file system commit here, right about 30 seconds in, and another file system commit here, right about 30 seconds later. And ButterFS doesn't have fixed locations for anything. We don't have a log that goes in one spot on the drive, and we don't have the yeah, inode tables extended for has to staircase things. So our I.O. just starts at the beginning and goes up. So you can see that happen twice. But it's really not entirely fair to compare just 60 seconds of runtime where the other guys have a lot more time to build up transaction commits and other things like that. So I did a longer ButterFS run where I created twice as many files. So instead of uh, 20 million files, this was 40 million files. And the interesting thing is you can see right about here, the system runs out of memory. 
and we have to start reading things again. Uh, and so our performance did go down. There was actually a pretty big delay right here where our performance went from 250,000 files per second down to 30,000 files per second. So we had to reread a whole bunch of stuff. This is not one of the links VM's big strong point. Butterfuss does copy on the right. We're always allocating a page and then pitching it as we replace the data in it. So we could definitely spend some time in the VM to make it a little bit better. Uh, but so you can see we have periodic writes for each commit where we do a whole bunch of I.O. That's where all the blue lines are. And then right here we start doing a whole bunch of reads. But we still averaged over the whole run right around 220,000 files per second. And we were pegged on system time the whole time, except when we did our reads. These ones are always really interesting. Uh, like I said, the file system developers, we use them a lot to uh, give each other a hard time. Um, it's just one particular run when Dave Jenner from XFS runs the exact same thing, and his version of XFS wins. I know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's always how it works out. So um, I'll leave the rest for questions, and please let me know what you do. Two, two entirely unrelated questions. Uh, the first is uh, the historical. A couple of years ago, we had Ted So come and give a presentation. He talked about export at the time. It was just sort of getting rolled out. And um, he, he had a conclusion, more of a lesson learned, that uh, there may be no single file system that can do everything. And I can see there are certain areas that you uh, are more optimal. I'm also curious, though, from your perspective, whether um, there are certain areas that you're not going to that's the wrong thing for me to say, but I'm asking like, what your take is, I guess, on that perspective and then where that puts your focus. That's the first question. Then the second one is um, the file system that wasn't mentioned here is, is ZFS, which I understand ButterFS was sort of a, not a reaction to, but related to, I guess, and wanting something similar because a lot of the features are, are, are similar. And I was wondering uh, what your thoughts were on ZFS and Linux and on the platform and ButterFS and Linux and other platforms and generally where, where that's going for you. Okay, so it, I, I kind of view them as very similar questions. I mean, um, I definitely agree with Ted. There's no one file system that's going to do everything. Linux has a lot of really strong file systems that are able to perform very well and have different features that you need. And um, you know, definitely inside of Facebook, we use XFS uh, for most of our database storage. Uh, anything that's MySQL sits on XFS. Um, so we do a whole bunch with different file systems. So I, I do agree. I mean, you know, from a ButterFS point of view, it will be a, it will be quite some time before we're performance competitive with an XFS or extended for a MySQL group. And that's okay. Because MySQL has most of those other features that ButterFS is providing. And you don't really need a ButterFS to do that for you. Um, in terms of ZFS, it, it was in the picture a little bit. I mean, you know, obviously there's snapshotting, there's integrity checking and things like that. Part of that was just, you know, what features do we want a modern file system to have? Um, you know, when ZFS is in the kernel, ever, if it ever happens, you know, it'll definitely be an interesting thing. But until the licensing allows it to be in the kernel, it's not, it's not really something that I've been Hi, uh, great talk. Um, just to follow up with Peter a little bit, what use cases besides databases would BitRFS be particularly bad for? Um, Thinking specifically, because it's copy on right here, uh, have Cal 2 images, but they maybe not be a good case, and also um, maybe uh, low uh, durability flash like MMC, that may be a good case or a bad case. Um, so, first, QCAL 2 images, virtualization is a database. Um, for all intents and purposes, you have some file system that's probably either extended for or XFS or RFS. And they're doing effectively random writes in the middle of a file. So um, it's very similar to a database workload. So you're not as good at virtualization as the other file system. You have an append-only format. I'm not sure if you have QCAL2 is append-only, I believe it is. Um, you know, that'll definitely alleviate some of that. But 
we will suffer in strict virtualization workloads uh, there. And what was the second question? Uh, same sort of thing with MMC, like if you have a lower durability flash, would the copy on be an asset or a use case like that, would it be a good or bad use case for better FS? Or just any kind of good and bad use cases you want to throw at us so you know when you have a good candidate for a better FS and when you have a bad candidate. Sure. So the really low quality flash um, checksums definitely help. You know, it's really good to know when you're getting garbage returned to you. I've had that happen on SSDs myself. Um, so that's a big bonus. Um, we tend to be a little bit more friendly to flash drives in terms of um, you know, how they keep erasure blocks open and things like that. So in the case of the flash drive, we tend to be a little bit more friendly than the other file systems. You've answered my question. I was going to ask about SSD support. <laughs> um, so Letterpress does explicitly support SSDs. It will detect them and slightly change how it uh, tries to allocate blocks. Um, the other thing that it does by default when it detects an SSD is uh, it turns off duplication of metadata in a single drive configuration. So in a single drive configuration, ButterFS will, um, by default, make duplicate copies of all the metadata. Not the data itself, just the metadata. And we have had this actually help you know, solve problems where drives were corrupting data and we were able to read the other copy and uh, turn it into something good. On Flash, we don't do it because uh, Flash tends to collect everything you write at a specific point in time and put it in the same place on the Flash. Uh, and so even though ButterFS is writing the LBAs that are all the way out here, Flash turns it into LBAs that are here. And you get no benefit but twice the usage. Hey, uh, it seems like you're doing a lot of uh, feature innovation. I'm wondering how you version file systems into specific file systems. And like if you upgrade a kernel, can you use the new features? And can you talk a little bit about that as from the point of view of somebody using a file system? Um, so, most of the features that we do won't actually involve any disk format changes, for the most part. You know, there are always things that uh, end up doing needing to change the disk format. The way that we do it is we only walk it forward. So we won't make it so suddenly your file system is unmounted. Uh, there may be a new feature that has a new feature flag. Uh, and so what will happen is we'll mount the file system and it will say, okay, I'm turning on this feature flag. And usually that's something you explicitly tell it to do. Uh, and from that point on, you won't be able to map the file system on and hold it from. Uh, but that's very rare. I think it's happened maybe two times in the last five years. So it's not something that happens often. Thank you. Could a kernel patch mitigate the memory uh, problem you had before when you showed the slides and all that? Um, I'm sure, well, the, the problem with any kernel patch is you can always fix something. Right. The question is, what else do you do? Um, so, yes, it could. It's definitely something that we haven't spent a huge amount of time optimizing the VM for. That workload was uh, very excessive on uh, doing cows and reusing pages, so that, that's why it showed so bad. It's well, not, the kernel patch would be geared toward that type of workload. Yeah, it's, it's certainly possible. Yeah, that's but, a thought out. I was just wondering if there's any other interesting characteristics that you found about disks. You certainly developed a file system you're going to work on that layer beneath you and get to know it a lot better than I have. Are there any interesting places that you found the sort of leaky abstraction problem where you mentioned like you write in one place and it'll actually write a few bytes ahead of where it's supposed to? Are there any uh, characteristics of disks that you might be aware of that you want to share? Um, so I, I will say there, there haven't been too many surprises. Disks for all of their flaws have, have been very similar for a very long time. It's a very iterative process, and the drive manufacturers are really pretty good. Uh, so things definitely do go wrong. I think you know, the big rule is you never get errors on writes. You only get errors on reads, and um, you know they slow down over time. Is the other surprise. I'm curious if anyone has considered using the file cloning support to create a totally version controlled file system. So you record every version of every file on, say, Google Mac. Anything else to add to that? 
Um, and as far as I know, nobody is looking into that. Mostly because things like Git and Mercurial end up being dramatically better at, at versioning on that granularity. Uh, I know that for NILFS, they, they you know they had the idea of the infinite number of snapshots until things get um, until things get garbage collected. That that kind of thing. Butterfest snapshotting is not exceptionally well suited to that. Uh, the, the disk format doesn't have a garbage collection system. We actually maintain explicit reference counts for every block in the file system, so we know um, how many people are using it and exactly who they are. So if I have a block that's gone bad, I can tell you which file that block belongs to, which is very useful, but is pretty bad for an infinite snapshot kind of setup where you want to do that kind of work. Um, you mentioned before 4K pages on Intel systems. Uh, the newer Linux kernels actually support uh, huge pages out of the box right now. Is that something that can be used by BetterFS? And contrarily, um, on the other side of the coin, um, uh, the 4K drives versus 5K uh, block drives, is there any implication for BetterFS up there? there? Um, so those are actually two, like, uh, you know, there's 4K in both of them, but they're two completely different. I know those are completely yeah. different. Pages, or okay. block pages. Um, so the huge pages are a little bit different. Um, right now, none of the Linux file systems can actually have a huge page map into the file system written down to it. It's kind of one of the more awkward parts of the huge page setup of Linux that uh, people are actively patching right now. Um, so I'm hoping that will get better soon, and I will definitely uh, help out support for that as part of because it's a very important piece. Um, Byte sector drives versus 4K sector drives. Um, Butterfs does 4K for everything, so we don't do anything smaller than 4K anywhere. We just kind of pretended that 512 byte sector drives don't exist. Uh, it will be interesting when they start coming out with either 32K sector drives or bigger, uh, which they certainly will eventually. Um, Butterfs has the ability for metadata. Our default metadata block size is 16K. Um, and we can go up to 64K. So we'll have uh, pretty good scalability in the future there. For data blocks, it'll just take some patches to the VM to make us right in whatever block size sector people want. Uh, you mentioned before that Facebook uses EXDFS for MySQL. Uh, we, we, use, we use XFS for MySQL. XFS. What's the main reason for that? Um, XFS is very stable. It's been around a long time. It's well supported. And it's fast. After getting that very unsubtle mention of Container Days Boston, the more well, the, the reason I'm saying this is because one of the talks that's coming up is about a file system in a file. Because with containers that seems to work pretty well. And I'm just wondering whether you whether the butter of this, whether there's some kind of that's somewhere in the future or whether you think containers because you mentioned virtualization as a kind of like a database, but I guess containers change that a bit. Your thoughts are on the right file systems for that? Well, uh, I, I do think that's a really important workload, so it's one that I want to be able to support better than we do now. Um, I think if you did a strict performance comparison between, you know, ButterFS, Extended 4, and XFS, you wouldn't do as well there. Um, the one, one thing I'll say is that the containers, at, at least for like the root file systems and all the stuff that you use to start up a container, it's not usually that IO intensive. So it's usually not, uh, it won't be slow enough to really be a problem. Um, you mentioned encryption being on your list at some point. I was just wondering, like, longer term, 10, 20 years, you know, five years, like, where do you see RFS going? What, what stuff would you like to see eventually maybe added? Um, so, long term file systems are not very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I hope it becomes more. I hope, it, I hope the features that we have um, become so well established that people don't first thing blame the file system when they get a corrupt block from the storage. Um, so it, that's really my goal, is I want it to be much more boring than it is now. I, I don't want people to invite me to talk anymore. You know, I just want to. <laughs> yeah, it seems like profile encryption would be a great application system. I do agree. <laughs> so 
So um, earlier you mentioned that uh, for database type workloads that um, ORFS currently allows lower than uh, for traditional file systems, but you said that it will take a you know, long time to catch up. But is there like a plan, long term plan to how to catch up? So uh, definitely, so the reason why we're slower, uh, there, there are two reasons. The first reason is that uh, we tend to fragment. So, um, and it's not really a problem with writing, it actually makes writing faster because we're writing in a more contiguous fashion. But when you go back to read the database later, um, all the planning that the database people did to keep their reads contiguous is thrown out the window. So you're really kind of undoing that work. Um, and then the second reason that we're slower is just because our metadata is relatively fat. So every time you make a new extent, it's more metadata to throw around, and you end up with something like that graph I showed where suddenly we're reading a whole bunch of stuff that nobody else has to read. Um, and so the solution to both of those is really kind of the same. Is uh, in order to in order to satisfy our copy on write requirements, we write somewhere else. We write somewhere else that's very fast, very easy to cache, and then we put it back into the original location. Um, and then you end up with bigger extents, less metadata, no fragmentation. So one of the things that I found like um, a bit confusing just, just to me basically is uh, trying to tell how much uh, free space is available at a given time. Uh, let's say for example if you have grade one or uh, like for level of grade. So is there like a specific formula that you use for, for calculating maybe like a, a specific method to, to say how much free space is available? Well, so the the reason why I'm figuring out how much space you have free in ORFS is so hard is because um, we allocate those chunks on the fly. And if you're doing something like a RAID 1 operation, we don't know how many, let me step back. Let's say you have RAID 1 that you have RAID 0 data, uh, which is a very common configuration. And uh, so what that ends up meaning is that um, in order to make a new metadata block, you need a very specific allocation that spans two drives and um, in a very specific configuration from the file system point of view. And we don't know if you're going to have that available to you in the future. Because you may all allocate a whole bunch of data blocks that have different requirements. And so you end up with like this strange set of fragmentation on the drive that's very hard to predict what it will look like. So we make estimates. It is how we do it. Once the drives are fully allocated, it's really easy to tell how much space you have left. Um, but until that happens, it's kind of a guess. One of the just, uh, similar questions to this is uh, when you do like, balance on the ORFS uh, file system, I mean, uh, it tends to, like, if you have different sizes of drives, sometimes it leaves out three drives that are completely empty if you don't write anything to it. Even though it's like you just do the balance. Is there like, a reason? So, is there a reason why we're leaving drives out during the balance operation? Well, the point of the balance is supposed to be to spread it evenly across the drives. Um, it may be that your RAID levels are uh, basically not, not evenly allocated. You know, we do one or two gig chunks. You shouldn't be leaving a drive out completely. It should be like much smaller differences than that. So that sounds like a bug. Um, I would say that email is for that. Hopefully this isn't a uh, irrelevant question. But from what I've uh, read, that hard drives have a firmware that uh, if it detects, if the drive detects a IO error, it will reallocate a, uh, a, uh, a new sector from this pool. Uh, and that's supposedly is done in the background. So if that is true, that the hard drives are really that smart, why is there a need to uh, have additional error correction? Isn't the drive sufficient? Is the drive doing a CRC check on each block, on each sector, or cluster, or whatever? Can you sort of... So, the drives do a whole bunch of things. And I'm sure that the drives are actually doing a very good job of returning far fewer corruptions than actually exist on the media. Um, first, the drives do relocate bad blocks. Every drive you have has like an area of um, blocks that are unused, and are just sitting there waiting to be relocated in to bad sectors. Um, but that replication doesn't happen until you get an error on the read, usually. So usually by the time it does that relocation, your data is gone. <laughs> um, 
but you will actually get an I.O. error back from the drive. That won't be a silent data corruption. Silent corruptions happen either because uh, the existing mechanisms that the drive is using for whatever reason didn't work. I talked about sometimes they do write to the wrong place, sometimes there are firmware bugs. You know, we've had it happen in production where um, backplane errors will introduce, you know, the OS writes one set of bytes and the drive gets a completely different set of bytes. So the data is passed and all of the drive's internal CRCs, but it's the wrong one. Thanks. Yeah, I just wondering if you could comment on uh, high performance computing environments, Australian environments, whether this makes any sense at all, and what issues you would have if you would implement uh, this file system in those integrity environments. I so you could also address like blocking issues that tend to crop up in HPC environments. So you know, my understanding of HPC environments is in oh, sorry. It, you know, depends on how you look at it. There are a whole bunch of different ways to do it. I don't know them all. Um, usually what the HPC environments will have is some local file system or a raw block device to actually manage my larger network file system. Um, and in that sense, in something like a Luster or something like that, using PowerFS to back underneath it, um, I, I think it's a pretty good use case. I don't know if anybody has actively done it. Um, Luster is another network file system that's commonly used there, and we're doing that internally. Um, so it's certainly used in some places already. It's not all by itself. I was curious, Butterfest is aware of uh, performance differentials between different sectors on the drive and or if you add new storage that's faster, you get the hints or not, is there any plan to connect? So on a single drive, uh, we pretend it's uniform. Um, it, you know, certainly you could get better performance by writing specific things on the inside versus the outside or vice versa, but uh, we don't get down to that level. Um, we do have, in the file system metadata, the ability to say this drive is much faster than that drive, but nothing is using that yet. So that's a planned feature in the future. Thanks. Yeah, I um, is there any other organization that's adding other feature sets for specific problems to BTRFS? Uh, outside of Facebook? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, going back to that first slide, um, SUSE does It's open source, it's flexible. So yeah, it's open source, it's in the kernel. Um, really, a, a large number of companies are contributing to it. SUSE uses it as the default file system in their enterprise software, so they contribute a lot of features, especially around the snapshotting and the quotas, which is who contributes to it. Um, so we've gotten uh, heavy development from a number of companies. Well, I mean, uh, aside from companies, so there are other work groups that are actively adding features that are specific to what they want. Um, you mean just individuals doing it? Yeah, individuals or groups or something. Yeah, we definitely get we definitely get a few people who just you know do it as a hobby kind of thing. Uh, you know, I, I'm not. And I want this feature, so I'm going to build it. Absolutely. On your contributors page, I saw that um, Sage Weil uh, and worked on BetterFS. Some uh, he's obviously uh, the lead contributor to Ceph. Ceph currently leverages XFS quite a bit. But I think they've talked about possibly switching to BetterFS as a default in the future. Can you comment on um, what you've heard about that, uh, or what kind of collaboration you have? So you know, Sage is a really good guy. Um, he has sent a lot of patches to BetterFS. They, they've done a fair amount of work on it. From a performance point of view, they were running into problems on, especially on large file systems. I think a lot of the patches that we've made at Facebook over the last uh, year or so make it much easier for them. Uh, so I'll definitely talk with them again about uh, doing some more trials. Ecash and ButterFS. Um, on one page of the wiki, it says that people are successfully using those together. On another page, it's on the gotchas or something that's maybe a little unstable. So uh, what do you think the current status of that is? So I, I will have to check the wiki and uh, see what those two pages are. Um, I know that there was, one of us was abusing the bio in a way that eCache did not expect. Uh, and I think we fixed that up, and I will have to double check. Uh, so if you want to send me an email, I'll have to have one. Is that like 4.0 fixed up? Or is that like? It, it would be relatively recent. 
Okay. It would be maybe 318 at the earliest. The lines mostly uh, died out. I guess lots of one last question and then we have to trivia. Um, I'm curious, and this is a little bit outside of the realm of the RFS, but since you're working on a file system like this, what do you see as the uh, coming over the horizon in the next year for people who buy and install physical disks? Uh, I, I guess that depends on the U.S. Physical disks, the big thing all of the drive vendors talk about is shingle drives. Um, and the drive vendors are desperately trying to find ways to continue ramping up the size of the drive, especially in terms of uh, competing with flash on the cost per gigabyte. Uh, and so... Well, by physical, I mean both, both uh, spinning disk as well as flash. Okay. So, spinning disks, definitely shingle drives. Flash, um, you know, the, the rate at which the technology is improving is amazing. And it's definitely kind of turning into a, a few different areas, you know, where some people are focused on pure performance and some people are focused on, you know, ultra inexpensive flash. Uh, with very high capacity, so you know, you're going to see it split out and differentiate even more than it already has. All right, so we're ready for trivia. Grab this mic. So, um, for those of you who are still here, thank you. We've got uh, three uh, ebook vouchers from O'Reilly and Associates back here, and we've got um, four books. We'll be giving away three of them. Chris will be asking questions. What I'm going to ask everyone to do is if you know the answer, Raise your hand, and I will try to pick on the first person who raises their hand. And um, if you have the answer, then you get to come up and take your uh, pick of the stack here. That's not fair? All right. All right. So the first question, are you all ready? <coughs> Which file system is best? Of course, so you're my first. Yeah. All right. Here we go. No bias. Uh, I, I'm sorry, was that like the best prize? Did I just do it? You can do whatever you want, man. This is your show. <laughs> All right. Uh, name three different RAID levels of RFS supports. Uh, so, thank you. Zero, one, five. All right. So, I was going to ask which book he actually took, if you can say. Uh, 20, 20, 20, 20. You bought it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so when ButterFS uh, divides up the disk, I said it divided it up into... I saw your hand up there first. Chunks. Chunks. All right. Firewall. Feel free to go right ahead. Okay. Uh, so next, ButterFS, and this was not actually, I don't think I used these words in the presentation, so we'll see who are in the uh, RFS, the suite of utilities that we use for um, very fast incremental uh, backups is called... Saw your hand there. No. No. This is a command line utility, the thing you run on the command line. Over here? In the back over there. There you go. Can you repeat that? Send and receive. Send and receive. All right. So just so you know, there are books here and there are ebook vouchers. Well, I think it's covered up right now. So we have a Perl book, a Python book, and three vouchers will be given away. Oh, two vouchers. Right. So we have two ebook vouchers and a book on Perl, five ISO. All right, so name two of the other companies contributing to ButterFS right now. All right, so you're in the here. Six of Red Hat. All right. Cool. And one more. One more question. Unless you want to do two more. I'll do one more. All right. <laughs> um, so one more question. I, they asked me to prepare these questions beforehand. Totally, totally did. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely did, did not do that. Okay. <laughs> wait, wait. Name the bar we're going to? Oh, that's always it. Name the bar we're going to. <laughs> Please, so I know where to go. <laughs> I don't think you can see the people raising their hand. Uh, storehouse? There we go. <laughs> You did great. I'm sorry. You, you can also call it off at five. If you, if you give me the cutoff signal, we're all the same. If anyone here ever needs a talk, it's up to you. 
Um, but I want to mention one other thing. Um, I was I came recently where there's a uh, another uh, meetup group called Ladies Who Linux. In case that's a plurality, so it's a separate group. They meet up and they talk Linux. In case you're a lady in Linux. All right. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much, Chris. I really want to